all that good stuff. All right, well, I want you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 54. We've been talking about the waters of Noah. I really didn't even get a chance to really get into kind of what I wanted to, to share. And um, again, make sure also that you get ready to uh, register for opening the heavens. It's going to be a very powerful conference this year. And make sure that you register so you know if you're coming or not. All right, I want us to look at Isaiah 54. And as you look at the text, I, I want to put things in proper perspective. You heard me say it uh, earlier. Oftentimes people think of the devil as bigger than what he is. They, they think of the devil like he's some big powerful uh, entity and somehow God is, you know, not as powerful. Well, what's greater, the uh, creation or the creator? You know, God is greater. And so we always have to remember that there's nothing too difficult for God. And when it comes to the devil, he always wins. God does. So the other thing that we need to understand, especially when you see a lot of evil going on, I say that because people are accrediting the enemy. When people say things like, well, we'll never see justice. When are these people going to be brought to a place of accountability? It's sick. America's finished. You know, I hear that all the time. Do you know that's an insult, I believe, to God? You, you, what I think happens is people are beginning to give more honor and, and uh, almost reverence to the devil and what he's doing and all his nastiness than to think that God can counter all of that and do something greater. No, they just quit, give up, and come into agreement, you know, that uh, nothing good is ever going to happen again. And I think it leads me to my next point. I am amazed. I've been saved since 1984. Uh, in June of 84, I remember I knelt down in my, my parents' basement my, where my room was, and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I was 18 years of age. And uh, let's see, so I'll be uh, 58 coming up here uh, on Friday. So that's been, what, 50 years ago? Is that right? So I've been saved 50 years I'm just uh, prophesying the future. <laughs> like I told you, when I went to school, we didn't have math. Um, Mom, it was weird school. All I remember is art and lunch and PE. It was a, it was a great, it was a great school. Um, but I've been serving God 40 years, and what I've learned though is I've learned the character of God. And I think sometimes when when you talk to people, it's amazing. I'm like. Do you really know God? Do you really understand? Because you wouldn't talk that way. You wouldn't think that way. You wouldn't have that perspective if you really, 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 really knew God. And I can tell you, I know God. I know his character. I know his ways. And I want to show you. All right, let's go to Isaiah 54. Now, pay very attention to the adjectives. For a small moment. Underline small. I have forsaken thee, God speaking, but with great mercy. So what's greater, small or great? Which one's bigger? Great. Notice it was a small moment, but notice the word on purpose, great mercies. Now, if you talk to people today, especially before the eclipse and even, I guess, after the eclipse was supposed to you know, be all this stuff, people were acting like, God's mercy was small and his judgment, because he ain't listening to us who are praying and walking right, it doesn't matter. They're acting like, oh no, his judgment and what he's going to do to America right now is greater in his wrath than in his mercy. And do you know that's uh, Abraham's problem? When God came down to talk to his covenant man, Abraham, in Genesis 18 and 19, God said, is there anything that I'm going to withhold? Is there anything that I'm going to keep a secret without telling my, my friend Abraham? And he comes down and Abraham only could see greater the condition of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the only thing he could see greater than the mercy of God is that God needed to judge it. He didn't believe in mercy. He didn't believe that God's mercy was greater. That's why he didn't include himself in his very own self-imposed numbering. 
Well, God, if there be 55 righteous or 50 righteous, will you spare it then? Well, that wasn't God's idea. It was Abraham's. And if he would have just stood up as one man and said, God, I believe in the great mercy of God. Those people don't deserve it. But what is the definition of mercy? Unmerited, undeserved favor. None of us really deserves to go to heaven. But we are because of his mercy. Right? All right. For a small moment, I've forsaken you. But with great mercies will I gather you. Let's keep reading. In a what kind of wrath? In a little wrath. God is being very clear. I hid my face. It is not, it's not little. It goes on and on and on. And I think when I talk to Christians, I'm like, man, the God that you describe, you make it sound like he's a grouchy old ancient of days. And he's been around a long time and he's tired of mankind. Right? You ever gotten around people, the older they get, they get grumpier? Brenda, don't say that about me. <laughs> okay. But it's probably true. I know I've become more indignant. Where things, you know, just irritate me more. How many of you can raise your hand? All you millennials are like, you wait. And you're part of my irritation too. No, I'm teasing. No, you're not. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you. I can mess with you. All right. In a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have what? Mercy, Mercy on you. Now notice what's connected. Saith the Lord your Redeemer. God always has a redemptive plan of mercy, of help and hope. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 9. Now he breaks it down. Say, break it down. Come on, man, you have no rhythm in here. Say, break. I have more rhythm than most of you. Say, break it down. Break it down. There you go. All right. Get you in the groove here. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. Notice he called them the waters of Noah. He didn't say this is as the flood waters that destroyed the earth. And we're going to talk about this. Why did he label it the waters of Noah? Now watch this, for as I've sworn that the waters of Noah, now he's telling you how he looks at the earth, how he looks at things. He's looking at it according to the waters of Noah in regards to a redemptive plan. He said, the waters of Noah, I swore that they should no more go over the earth. So I've sworn that I would not be angry with you. I wouldn't rebuke you. <clears throat> Keep reading. For the mountains shall depart. You're going to see some things in the natural. And hills are going to be removed. But my kindness is going to be consistent. It will not depart from you. It's amazing when something happens to somebody. People automatically want to get on the bandwagon that they did something. They angered God. They opened a door. Well, what are you going to do when you get uh, in front of Apostle Paul? Are you going to accuse him? What door did you open, Paul? That you were beaten three times, left for dead. Shipwrecked continually. I would never go on a cruise with you, Paul. <laughs> right? You know, it's, it's because of who Paul was. The man of God he was and the God that he served that the enemy kept trying to bring, you know, things against him. But again, it doesn't change the fact that God's kindness shall not depart from you. You might be facing something right now. They might be telling you that your job is done. They might have given you a pink slip or another color slip. God's kindness will not depart from you. Come on. Even if you've received a diagnosis, God's kindness will not depart depart from you. He will be good to you. He will be good to our nation. He is. Neither shall, watch this, the covenant of my peace be removed. That was settled in the greatest redemptive plan ever known to man or history. It was Jesus Christ coming and dying that God's wrath would be forever satisfied. That's why the angels showed up the host of them and said, peace on earth doesn't mean you'd have peace and no war. It just means God's wrath has been satisfied. He's not angry at man. Now he gets mad at, and, at man's sin and their purposeful iniquity, right? But my peace shall not be removed, saith the Lord, that has what? Mercy on you. Now this is important because I want you to look at Luke chapter 21. 
And I want us to look at verse 25. So we can see where God talked about the difference between, you know, little wrath and eternal, long-lasting loving kindness. God is trying to literally say that we have to have the right focus. We have to have the right perspective, right? We have to listen correctly. You know, it reminds me of a story of a healing evangelist that came into a church. And he says, all right, I am going to pray for anyone who has a need. And so what he does is he, the preacher begins to uh, <clears throat> pray for anyone that has a need. And a man comes up to the front and he says, hey, uh, I, I have a request for my hearing. And immediately the healing evangelist grabs the oil and does exactly what he read in the Bible. He mimics Jesus and he puts his fingers in the man's ear and he says, come out, you deaf and dumb spirit. And he anoints him with oil and does all the jerking and, and pulls his fingers out. And he says to the man, how's your hearing? The man looks at him and goes, well, my hearing is next week. So, so sometimes, so some, don't start in on that O stuff. Okay. <laughs> but that's how we are. We just jump to conclusions. We don't take time out to listen to God. We don't take time out to just, you know, take a chill for a minute. Let's make sure we got the right perspective. No, most people, their human nature is they always go towards the way of the negative. How many of you know people that never see a glass half uh, full? They always see it half empty. You get around people like that. Well, you can't be that way with God. You can't be, whenever something happens, that you have more of a faith in wrath and God's anger than you understand in the greatness of his mercy. Now, look at Luke 21. We know about what it says. There'll be signs in the stars. There'll be signs in the sun and the moon. And upon the earth, there's going to be distress of nations. Now, wait a minute. Are we seeing distress of nations? Are we seeing it with perplexity? Yes or no? Yes, we are. We're, have we seen the seas rise and the winds begin to roar? Yes, we have. But you know what we need to remember? What did God say in Isaiah 54? I have a sign that is, I'm, I'm held to a promise. I'm held to a standard. And that standard is the waters of Noah. It is a reminder to me that I am to forever honor my covenant of peace in the earth. I am to forever, with great mercy and loving kindness, administer that to the people of this earth. What God looks for is people like Moses. When a nation is in trouble and God wants to, by his righteousness, he has to wipe them out according to what they deserve. Moses stands up and demands God's mercy. Why am I saying this to you? Because I feel like we are in America right now and we have these eschatology preachers that are trying to connect all the dots to convince us that somehow everything is, is biblical uh, prophecy being fulfilled that basically you better just stick your head between your legs Kiss your present and your future goodbye and wait until the sound of the trumpet from the archangel and God catches us away because it isn't going to get any better. And I want to say, how dare you, how dare you, how dare you forget about the God who has a covenant of peace, a God of great mercy that is waiting for somebody in the earth to stand up and say, we may deserve judgment. We may deserve you to forsake us at this time. God we may deserve with what they've done to the children but I stand before you even if I am one man one woman one church like Moses you will remember your covenant and you will show us mercy we don't deserve it but then you should have never said that your mercy is everlasting and greater I hold you to that oh God who does not lie Therefore, you will bring resilience to America. You, will, you are saving this country. 
You are resetting it. And you are bringing divine reversals that are going to bring kings down and raise up new leadership. And you are going to reset our universities. You're going to reset our school systems. You're going to reset our Supreme Court. And you're going to remove wicked judges. Oh, God of mercy. I get so righteously angry when there's any kind of comet in the sky, uh, solar eclipse, lunar eclipse, because people always go towards the way of negativity and fear. And I'm like, you know, when our nation is at a critical moment like it is now, it is not the time to bend towards that. You need to bend towards God. We need you and your mercy. Look at verse 26. So when these things happen, men's hearts are going to fail them for fear. Why? Because they're going to listen to, pros, uh, to uh, eschatology preachers. And, 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 and you know what? Can I ask you a question? The eschatology preachers were preaching for 40 years, late great planet Earth, getting everybody in fear. And most of the stuff that they talked about during those 40, 50 years never happened. And then they, then they misinterpreted, as in the days of Noah, don't be left behind. If you read what Jesus said in Matthew 24 and Luke 17, it was the wicked that were taken. And, and, and it's not even an eschatology scripture to, to try to prove the rapture. Because Luke 17, it says that the ones that were taken away, the disciples asked them, where, where, are, they, where are they going? And Jesus says, the place of the vultures, the place of, of dead flesh. Oh, really? It sounds like the triumphant church is going to the place of the vultures? He wasn't talking about a rapture scripture. Now, then somebody on social media had to write and say, oh, pastor, you don't believe in the rapture. That's not what I said. I said, listen to me. Read my lips. Those are not correct doctrinal scriptures to use for the rapture. I believe in the catching away of the church. So can I say this in my defense? Pull your head out. Okay. Sorry, but sometimes I, my wife won't let me respond. Because I'm going to make up a fake name like they all those trolls do. And I'm going to troll back at them. Men's hearts fail them for fear. Because they're looking at things that are coming on the earth. They're listening to all these people. And the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That's not God's throne. That's not the angels. It's not your mansion. You know, you get up there. God, where, what's all these cracks? Oh, the powers of heaven were shaken. No, that ain't the heaven he's talking about. He's talking about the satanic realm. Amen. Now, look at what Jesus said. Verse 27. All right, let's go. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And by the way, that is not just an end time verse. He's going to continue to keep coming in power and great glory to raise up a triumphant church without spot, blemish, and wrinkle. That's what he said. Look at verse 28. How do we handle things? How does the waters of Noah? Notice he called them the waters of Noah. Because God did not call them the waters of the flood, he wanted to call them the waters of Noah so that you and I would forever understand that God is a redemptive God. God is always a God of mercy. He is always a God of, of, of help and hope. Doesn't mean he doesn't judge, because he does say in the book of Isaiah that while his judgments are in the earth, men will learn righteousness. You, you want what you see in Exodus 14. You want God's judgments in the earth, and you want his mercy. What, 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 where do you see it? Exodus 14, which side of the cloud are you on? When God showed up in his power and glory, he brought great judgment against a socialistic, communist, Marxist, terroristic empire called Pharaoh and Egypt. And he judged them harshly through 10 plagues and then took them out in the Red Sea. Hint, hint. But he showed on the other side his redemptive plan. He saved a nation in a day. So we want God's judgment to come and deal with wickedness, deal with evildoers, deal with corruption, right? Tear down kings, like I said, and give us some good ones. But for us, we want mercy. 
We want mercy. And you know what? We want mercy even on those that don't deserve it. Right? When I was praying April 26th for the tornado, I didn't just say, and God only spare those who believe in thy name. No, I was praying for the whole city, just like you should. Right? But here's what Jesus taught us. When you see things in the earth, quit gravitating. Remember verse 26. Men's hearts will fail them for fear. Why? Because they tend to gravitate thinking that God's wrath is greater than his mercy. He's got great wrath and anger and he's impatient, but boy, he's got little mercy. Uh Uh-uh. You didn't read the scripture. Isaiah 54 said, no, he had a little moment. He had little wrath, but he has everlasting kindness. He has great mercy. And Jesus said, when things start happening on the earth, nations in perplexity, wars, rumors, of wars, earthquakes in various places. Don't gravitate towards negativity or fear. He said, look up, get your perspective right. That's why I shared the joke about the man and his hearing. Because we're not hearing right. Jesus said, here's what you do. Verse 28, you are to look up, get your focus right, quit looking at what the beast can do, and the Antichrist, and the 666-666. By the way, we had somebody call us years ago. They gave us our phone number here in the church. And a guy called up and said, I knew you guys were a cult. (laughs) What? He said, your phone number reveals it. By the way, those of you that are watching, our phone number here at the church has been this way 25 years. is 402 896 Six six nine two. Six six six. I think God did it on purpose just to mess with you all. I mean, settle yourself down. My God, it's only a phone number. It ain't an encrypted code that is a satanic church with the mark of the beast. And I knew Hank was antichrist. Are you kidding me? I'm all Christ. I love God. All right, see how stupid we get? The lady's scanning your grocery. You're watching it. Clang, clang. You know how it makes that noise? Clang, clang. And it's getting close. Right? $66. She scans the next item. And 60 cents. Oh! And it comes up, six, 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 ma'am, here. And you throw a, a pack of gum on there to bring it to $66.70. Don't laugh because you know you've done that. All right, can I tell you a secret? All right, I'll tell you a secret. I'm going to tell on me, okay, because I'm all smacking you today, so I'm going to... Smack myself. All right, I would tell on me. So when we first started social media, I didn't even know what social media was. Everybody's telling me, you need to go on Facebook. What's Facebook? You need to go on Instagram. What's Instagram? I don't know what that stuff is. So I came on my Instagram. I don't know how many people I have now. But I remember it was at 666. And I called the office and I said, can you just find somebody to follow me? I have 666 followers. Did I not? I did. I said, please go knock on somebody's door and say, follow Hank Kuhneman at at Hank Kuhneman. (laughs) I did. I called. Was it because Pastor Hank was scared of 666? No, it's just, I didn't want some yahoo to write me. See, I knew he was connected to the beast. (laughs) I mean, you know what I'm saying? See how we, why am I preaching this way? I don't have no, you're all messing me up. I mean, it's true. It's like we so gravitate. And you know, when people talk about the end times, the end times is don't be left behind, right? Look at what's happening. Turkey's acting like a turkey. And it's starting to align itself with Gog. And we know who Gog is and we know who Magog is. And by the way, Gog, Magog, did you ever notice 
I know Jesus said that you'll know the season. It'll be during Christmas because Gog eggnog, uh, gogging, uh, it, it sounds, I just messed my joke up. Sounds a lot like eggnog. Gog, magnog, gog, magog. Jesus said you'll know the season. Sounds like eggnog season. Oh, I'm telling you. I, and we get so weird about stupid stuff. And yet Peter stands up and has to say, yo, he did, he, he had rhythm, yo, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, saith the Lord, 666 shall arise, the beast shall arise, the antichrist shall arise. You'll go to the grocery store and there'll be no bread for food or water to drink. Don't be left behind. You better put your head between your legs and don't be left behind and kiss your behind goodbye. That's not what Peter says. And in the last days, saith the Lord, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons, your daughters shall prophesy. Come on. Your old men shall have visions and dreams and young... We never talk about those last days that have to do with anything of God's great mercy, his power. Everything is the power of some guy that's arise. Because we got our perspective off. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up. All right, everybody, just humor God. Look up. Just look up. Some of you need to do that every day. Just look up. I do, and I notice water damage in my home. All right, well, you know, listen, just, just keep looking up. Okay. Keep looking up. Get your perspective right. Because now watch this. He shares with you a principle. Look up. Get your focus right. Get your perspective right. Lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. Now, we know that that's ultimately what he's going to do. He's going to catch us away. Our redemption draweth nigh. But you know what? As long as the Holy Spirit is in the earth. Jesus said, I go away. And, and the disciples are like, where are you going? He's like, I've been trying to tell you, boys. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm not going to leave you without help. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit who's going to come in my name. And he's going to remind you of what I said. He's going to lead you in all truth. He's going to guide you, right? Yeah. Didn't he say that? And then he said, now listen. And then it says in the Bible that even the Holy Spirit is the one that is restraining the Antichrist. Right. So who's got more power? And when the Holy Spirit is lifted off the earth, then that Antichrist will be able to come to power. But as long as God's Holy Spirit is here, he will always, he has to, he cannot violate his covenant of peace. He cannot violate his covenant of mercies. He will always have a redemptive plan. Why do you think God woke me up on Tuesday so that we could pray Wednesday night? Actually, it was Wednesday morning, early Wednesday morning, 4-11. And I heard tornado sign. God has a redemptive plan. He had warning. And he was trying to tell us, I have a plan of help and I have a plan of hope. I need you to be on the offense, church. Right? All right. So let's get our perspective right. How many believe we should? Now, God calls it the waters of Noah. Go back to Isaiah 54, verse 7. And, and I want you to see this. Actually, verse 9. Because notice what he calls them. This is extremely important that you see this. So he's talking about his loving kindness is greater than his wrath. Right? We have a covenant of peace with God, a covenant of mercy. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. In other words, he's saying, this is my reference point. I'm a God that placed my word higher than myself, so I have to do what my word says. I have raised a standard. I have declared a promise. And that's why of all the symbols that the people who call it Pride Month, and they mock God's rainbow, it's amazing. Of all the things they could have chosen, they choose that rainbow. But that rainbow is a sign in the earth of what you're reading right here. As the waters of Noah unto me, it's a sign that God is held to a standard. He's held to a promise that he will never, ever destroy the earth like that. Well, will, will God destroy? Will he allow destruction to come? Listen, I'm convinced that God allows what we allow. 
We are the spiritual atoms in our gardens, whether they be in our neighborhoods, our city, our, our states, our nation. And we are the ones that are to enforce the delegated authority given to us by the risen Christ. That's why today, don't wait till they start prognosticating about tomorrow. We already did it. You need to keep declaring. No, tomorrow I speak peace over Omaha, the surrounding areas. And I think one of the mistakes we made is I was praying over Omaha and I was praying over, you know, the different cities. And I felt like we should have extended that grace line out farther than what we did. I do. For as the waters of Noah are unto me, I've sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. I've sworn that I would not be angry with you or rebuke you. Okay, why did he call them the waters of Noah? First of all, what does Noah's name mean? Does anybody know? It means rest. And God said on September 5th of 2019, we've shared this prophecy before in the church. God said that this decade that we're in right now, it was that OTH. This is why you need to get through this year. God said the decade would start off dark and harsh, but then you would end up in rest. Amen. So when people say, well, we're in the days of Noah, well, I'll come into agreement with the rest. I'll come into agreement with what did the days of Noah do? God dealt with evil. He dealt with corruption, right? He wiped it out, exposed it. But what did he do? He, through his mercy, caused there to be a redemptive plan. And he reset the earth and brought a divine reversal. So those are the days of Noah that I feel is what we're in right now. So Noah means rest. So he's saying, listen, I'm calling it the waters of Noah because God's heart is to bring you into rest. But here's what it also means. The name Noah, not only does it mean rest, but it means repose. R-E-P-O-S-E, -E, repose. Here's what it means. Repose means a state of resting after there has been great extortion or strain. Why would God say in 2019, September 5th, prophetically? He nailed exactly what this decade started off. Harsh, has it not, with all the you know, pandemics and, and all of that stuff that we saw. But then notice what God said would be the result. You're going to come up into rest. This is why I think the Spirit of God is having me preach this stuff is because He's trying to get our mouth to align with what He wants and what He's doing. Otherwise, be it done according to your faith. Be it done according to your words. If you want damnation, if you want to think that justice will never come, well, then keep speaking it. And that's exactly what we'll have. But I believe God, if He can listen to one man... I don't care about you all. I'm going to keep being before his face. You know, I'm saying that respectfully. I'm not. I'm just saying I'm not looking to anybody right now. You can't count on anybody. You can't count on anybody, especially the ones that you elect to do anything that you ask them to do. They all become rhinos or uh, leftist, uh, Marxist, socialistic, evil people. But I, I mean, you can't even count on preachers. You can't even count on Christians. Somebody that I know was with a, a great, oh, they, I, I'm not even going to call people great men of God anymore because half of them won't stand up for anything. You know, they're just a bunch of wusses with big ministries. They won't do anything, say anything, stand up for anything. But boy, they sure love the crowds and the accolades. I like what Jesus, he, was the, he had the greatest audience of all. He made himself of no reputation and all only wanted to honor his father. But anyway, somebody recently told me that this uh, <clears throat> very well-known man of God, and I'm not going to mention who it is. I don't do that stuff. And don't try to name and figure out in social media who it is. I get tired of that. If I make a point, leave off your interpretation, okay, of who I'm talking about. Because I'm trying to. The body of Christ has had enough railing on one another and calling people out. I'm just trying to make a point. But it's very alarming because this person has a lot of influence. And they said, oh, with the upcoming election, I don't know if I'm going to vote for either one of them. I don't, I don't like either one of them, Trump or Biden. I thought, if you are that much of an idiot, I would welcome the opportunity, and I might just call this person and tell him, I think you're an idiot. You don't know who to vote for. You don't like either one of them. This isn't about whether you like them or not. It's about what, what do you want for your children? 
What do you want for your life? What do you want for your ministry? This isn't hard. Good, evil, it's, it's so blatant anymore. But you know, you get these people anymore that they, it's like they just don't, they don't stand for anything. I don't know, why am I saying that? Why am I saying that? What was the point? All right, well, thank you because I don't remember what I was, anyway, I remember. But Noah's name means joy and pleasure. Now, the waters of Noah was a reference point. Now, I want to bring you to the first point. The waters of Noah, it's important that we understand that God always has a redemptive plan. Now, let me show you, though, it requires human responsibility. Look at Matthew 23, 37. I just want to throw that scripture up. Because sometimes people will hear prophecies or they'll hear, you know, certain things that God will say and they think, okay, well, you know, everything is just automatic. God always has a redemptive plan. Do you know you have to come into agreement with the redemptive plan? You have to come into agreement with what God is saying. You can't just be, you know, half-hearted. And Jesus is speaking and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Okay, this is the city. You've killed the prophets. You stoned them which are sent unto you. How often I would have. Notice would have means it didn't happen. How often I would have. Just like that, that, that famous person. It's staring them right in, the, in their face. Who is the right candidate of the two. Or the one that makes the most common sense. And you can judge it by way of fruit. This isn't a political thing. Just Jesus said, know them by their fruits. Well, look at the fruit of 2016 to 2020 and look at the fruit from 2020 to now. It's not hard to see the difference. And Jesus said, how often I would have. I would have gathered you. I would have gathered your children. I would have done something for their generation. But no, you'll go put a check mark next to a liberal who believes in abortion, murder in the womb and outside of the womb. And that little baby is crying on the birthing table, just got done. Oh, you got such and such amount of time to decide whether we're going to murder it or not in the name of abortion. You're a sick individual. I don't care if you're a rhino. I don't care if you're a loony liberal. It is sick. How often I would have gathered your children. I would have raised up people who are fighting for your children. And I would have gathered you together as a hen. I would have brought preservation to your nation. I would have pulled you out of the mess like a hen with her chickens under her wings. But you would not. So who was the responsibility on? The prophets? Was the responsibility upon the people that God sent? No, their responsibility was to deliver the word, deliver the message, share what God was saying, and it was up to the people to decide. That's why, listen to me, we have a prime.